Welcome back for another week. Um, I hope uh, everyone, if you missed last week, that you had a chance to go, go through and read uh, the story and life of St. Anthony. If you didn't, again, I sent that, uh, the whole document home and with an extra copy that uh, John sent along, which is a little bit more uh, grammatically correct. So I hope that you get a, get a copy of that and get a chance to go through it. Is of course a little bit more uh, intimidating to read than the rest of the the lives that we're going through, just because of its length. But it is a beautiful reading and very well uh, uh, worth reading. I have another copy of the whole reader. If someone wants one, and it looks like Lois is the winner. And uh, so we're 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 moving on this week and. Over these next few weeks, uh, there are really just three more lives or, or let's say, thematic um, saints that we're going to be looking at today, specifically the married saints, Peter and Favronia. Next week, we're going to be reading uh, Perpetua and Felicitas, who are early martyrs of the church and speaking about the role of martyrdom in the church. And then, so we have this week, next week, and we have a week off. I'm out of town. And then 13th will be our last week, and where we're going to speak about modern saints. And the two modern saints we're going to be looking at are St. Porfirios, and then our beloved uh, St. Gabriel of Georgia. So I, I'll, I'll mention real quick, I had, uh, I asked my... Uh, former professor and mentor, Dr. Tim Petitzas, who we should do for a modern saint because he loves the modern saints. And he said, oh, you have to do uh, Father G- G- Gabriel of Georgia. And when we go and reread these last two lives, you're going to notice the character of the stories are much, much different than the ones that we're, we've been reading so far, mostly just because of their modern nature. But I think it adds a lot of uh, uh, life um, to these to these stories when you read a modern state. Hmm? And we had the opportunity to visit his tomb several years ago. So we definitely have that affiliation with him. Uh, Father Evan and a group of us were in Georgia for the wedding of Deacon Mark and Shemasiana's younger son, Zach. So we had a little pilgrimage that we added on to the wedding. It was quite lovely and got to... The other Georgia. The other Georgia. The other Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> Georgi's Georgia, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll speak about that, and that'll be our last uh, class on August 13th. And I'm really excited to talk about that, mostly because it's important for us to realize that the saints aren't just, you know, people that lived thousands of years ago, but they're amongst us, they're present. It's a current reality of the church, and every day we have an opportunity to meet saints, right? Even here in our own community. Um, and as Father Evan mentioned today, if you were here during the churching of my now youngest son, Athanasios, he's a, uh, named, let's say, uh, unofficially named after Bishop Athanasios, who, who visited us many, many uh, times over the years. And so, and, and I think many people consider him to have been a, a saint. So anyway, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few weeks. But today we're going to be uh, speaking about uh, Peter and Favronia. And I have a lot of kind of varied things to talk about here, let's say in the context of, uh, you know, married saints in general and uh, the historical role of these um, uh, figures and then how they how they are are so revered in modern day Russia and also uh, the, the nature of the story itself, because it's very different than the story of St. Anthony. I mean, in terms of its length, of course, it's much shorter, but even the style of it is, is significantly different from that of St. Anthony's. It's, it's much more fairy tale esque And I, after I finished reading it, I thought, oh, this probably could be a Disney movie. Mm-hmm. I, I was, <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Somebody could have adapted it into a Disney movie. <laughs> Um, but you could, you could see a lot of those elements present in the story. I trust that... Miyazaki before I trust Disney. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> that would be good. That would be good. Um, but anyway, I, th- I think you get my point at least in that in the aspect of the style of the story. And a lot of these stories in this style that, that, we, that you see in there uh, is something that's very prescien- uh, present in Russian stories as well. They have a very rich fairy tale history. 
Um, like, you know, Western culture has the Brothers Grimm, and the, uh, Russia has a very, very large fairy tale history, oral history especially as well. So a lot of that, let's say, is built off of that model. I wish I was more fluent in, in Russian fairy tales. They're supposed to be really beautiful, spectacular. Um, and in fact, I just recently ordered a couple books on Russian fairy tales. There's a deacon, I forget his name off the top of my head, who's translated several fairy tales. Yeah, Nicholas Kotar, who has translated several fairy tales uh, into English recently, and he's been, he produced a book, just in a couple of books, very recently. So I, I, I ordered the book, actually, I'm kind of excited to, to go, go through them. Because uh, I think as we spoke about, really, in the introduction, that, you know, storytelling is intrinsically a, you know, a human desire. And the, story, the stories that we read, you know, whether it's in the life of St. Anthony here, or Peter and Favronia, they speak to a human condition. And they're meant to draw us in uh, and, and, you know, in this case, to, to teach a lesson or, uh, as I said, with the lives of the saints to, let's say, inculcate this love and desire for God. So, yeah, well, let's um, – I, I wanted to back up before getting into the story itself – and just speak about, um, you know, married saints in the church. They're oftentimes less spoken about than other saints that you hear in the church. Most often, if you hear a saint in the church, what is the saint in terms of their background? Or usually an ascetic, right? You usually hear about ascetic saints. You might hear of uh, priests, um, uh, nuns, uh, bishops, uh, etc. So these are typically the, the, the saints that you hear about in the church. And I, I wouldn't call this an unhappy thing that's occurred. I think it's a, a natural kind of uh, progression that's happened, mostly because the, the ascetic saints are more known for these miracles and great deeds that they performed in their lives. Right? We look at St. Anthony and all the great things that have happened, that, that happened in St. Anthony's life. But there's some very famous stories involving St. Anthony where, for example, um, he is earnestly asking a question of saying, is there anyone in the world as holy as me? And the way that it's written in the text is not meant to be like an egotistical you know, question, but more like, a, is, there, is it possible to be holy in the world? And this angel says, well, here's an address, basically. He says, go to Alexandria, here's an address, and find this person, and this person is holier than you are. And he's like, oh, I need to meet this person. And he goes to the Alexandria, and he goes to a home, and it's a cobbler. And he just speaks to this cobbler, and he's like, who is this holy man? And he, he encounters this cobbler, and, and he's like, well, what do you do? Like, what, you know, what great ascetic practices do you do? And he goes, oh, holy father, I, I don't do any, you know, holy ascetic practices. I simply pray each day. I don't cheat my customers. I, I, I pray for my customers. I offer, you know, what I can to the poor. And it was all these very, very simple things. Nothing extraordinary, no miracle working. And through this conversation with the cobbler, St. Anthony realizes this man is holier than I am. And so a lot of times it's easy for us to exalt, you know, these characters like St. Anthony and these, these great wonder workers and miracle workers that, you know, are part of the tradition of the church. But so many times we also see it pointed in the other direction, that great holiness isn't just about going into the desert. It's not about doing these great feats. It's just following the simple practices and uh, commandments that are given to us by God. And doing this on every day, consistently. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I backtrack, but what yeah. do you mean by uh, ascetic? Oh, ascetic, like a, a, a monk living in the desert, uh, fasting, praying, not living a life out in the world. Yeah, okay. yep. So ascetic practices. Um, so, <clears throat> and, and, and you know, these other characters often get, let's say, all the glory. But I always want to emphasize that everybody has the opportunity to become a saint uh, in our everyday life to practice consistently the way of the church. And, you know, I, I, another, sorry, I, I love all these little stories. This is, you just share these little stories and they're fantastic. Uh, there's a brother who is in a monastery and he was nearing... Um, 
the end. He was about to die. And the, the other monks were very concerned for him. And they, sent, they went to the abbot and they said, you know, we're, worried, we're really worried about Brother Simeon. He hasn't been dutiful in going to church. He hasn't been consistent on doing his work every day. And we're worried about the salvation of his soul. And then the abbot's like, well, I've seen these, these, two, these things too. Let's go speak to him. And so they go talk to, again, Brother Simeon, whatever his name was. And they say, you know, you haven't done all these things that are part of, you know, the monastic life. Are you, are you not worried about your salvation? And he's like bright and happy. And he's like, no, I'm so excited to pass away. He's like, why? You haven't done any of these things. He's like, because I believe my Lord when he said, do not judge and you will not be judged. And my whole life, I have not judged anyone. No, no, it was... It was earnestly said. No, I'm not talking about him oops. Oh, them oops, yeah, yeah. So, so he found his salvation by not judging. And, you know, not necessarily having to do all these extra things. So, again, the, there's this simplicity that's part of the faith about living a Christian life. And uh, a lot of times, you know, saint, sanctity and sainthood isn't glorious, Right? It's just the simple, small things that you do every day. Um, so with that, that, that's just what I want to highlight, like in the context of marriage, like what marriage is. And, and even though the church doesn't highlight in the same way the, you know, the, the large numbers of um, married saints, it doesn't mean that it is not a path to salvation. And today we're just reading this one story of Saints Peter and Favronia which is one story of many of, of married couples, um, but <clears throat> you know it does have a strong and important place in the life of the church. Uh, and and you know the purpose of marriage really is a road to salvation, just like the role of monasticism. So they're not divorced from each other. It's not you can be holy or you can be married. Because if you're married, you're you're like well this is a path to being holy as well. <laughs> Um, and yeah. Can I hopefully only very slightly divert yeah, yeah. based on what you just said? Yeah. Um, this path of salvation concept, I was thinking about it again. Um, I guess I was thinking about it after the first class. Mm -hmm. And how I think you even referenced the thief on the cross, mm -hmm. lived this simple, passionate life right up till the last moments, and then yeah. he believes in Christ and um, I think that, that that story would back up sort of like the soul of day by faith alone mindset that at least I kind of grew up in where there's no path to salvation. You believe or you don't mm. and you are saved or you're not. And, right. And then there, you know there's a conversation about losing your salvation stuff. But sainthood it just seems like I'm hearing you say that everybody's path to salvation is different. Yeah. What why why would why would not judging or just that moment of belief, the declaration of Christ on the cross be like enough when for so many others they're gonna labor over their fasting or labor over their um, this ascetic life that they live all their life, like St. Saint Anthony. Yeah. Um, I'm curious just what you might say about that. Yeah, well, one thing that we could highlight immediately is, um, let's think of that sermon that's given by St. John Chrysostom at Pascha. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you remember the sermon, he says, what, everybody be joyful today. If you labored from the first day or if you've just come here at the 11th hour, if you've just arrived, everyone is welcome. And one thing we have to remember is, you know, fasting, these labors, these struggles and everything, they're not meant to be like oppressive. It's not like we're going out and we're, you know, painting ourselves with all these practices and then that suffering and whatever, you know, that, that pain is what brings us to salvation. That's not it at all. In fact, if we're not fasting, if we're not participating in these practices with a joyful spirit, then, then they really don't have purpose. So, you know, participating in, in these ascetic practices is something that should be joyful. 
and um, not something that, oh, I've done this and I've earned salvation as a result. Because we have to remember that salvation is, is really relationship, right? It's participating in the divine. And it's, it's made clear in many, many uh, uh, instances that that can be over the course of your lifetime or it can be in that last moment. And I, I think, you know, th- this, this often gets into confusion in that it is something that's earned. And it's not. It's a yeah. gift that's freely given. And we also hear this in, like, the parable of the workers, Right? The workers work all day long, and the promise of their work all day long is salvation, the pay. And then even the person who comes at the end, they are given the same thing. So should the workers at the beginning be unhappy about the workers at the end? Well, the answer is no, especially when we're talking about salvation. We should all rejoice that people are saved. I I think I mentioned this either in this class or another, that, that the martyrs in heaven rejoiced at the arrival of St. Paul, who tortured them and sent them to death, right? So we rejoice over everyone, and, and, and we, we you know, are saddened over the death of a sinner. So I think it's just, it becomes dangerous for us to compare. Like, oh, I did this, and you didn't do a lot, but you still get this? Like, how does that make any sense? I think that bothers me mostly there is that in some cases it seems like almost a cognitive choice that a person has made that, that and they suddenly are in relationship with Christ and I'm sure that that's not true but it's that it's that sort of eastern western dichotomy where I'm trying to get back to you know living and thinking in a non-reductionist way or and where salvation isn't just a choice that I make or a, or an assent to an assertion that I make right it's, it's more than that but yeah there are these moments when with the saint for every now and then you come across someone who it seems like just was had almost like a like a thought that saved them. Right. And that confuses me because I'm trying to get away from that idea that just a simple thought can save you. Um, yeah, no, I, th- I think um, especially in those instances where we're talking about the end of the life, like it does seem like it is just that one thought. Yeah. And I don't, have a good, I don't have a good response necessarily to that other than to say that, you know, there, there's a, let's say, a very, very low capital, lowercase tradition that God takes us at the most opportune moment. And, you know, if this is the thief at the cross when he's able to find and profess his faith in Christ, then that's when he takes the thief on the cross. And, you know, it's... Um, it's, it's a challenging thing and uh, difficult to think of why some people go their whole lives and then, you know, and, and if you go your whole life, you know, enwrapped, in, in uh, uh, encased in sin, have you really had a good life? I mean, even from your own standards, like as soon as you reach that moment of your conversion, you're like, my whole life before this has been imprisonment and it's only now that I find freedom so I, I, I would steer clear of that idea that living outside of the church is somehow like, oh, I wasn't doing any work, when really you were just in prison this yeah. whole time and you didn't even know it. Yeah, that's a good point. You're right? Just, you're just you're miserable. You were miserable yeah. and you didn't know it. I, I, I met a couple of people who, um, who were at Holy Cross, and there was a point where they were just non-Christian, right? You know, atheists. And then they came to life in Christ and they said... I don't even remember my life before becoming a Christian. Like, I remember events, but I don't remember it being a life. And then all of a sudden, like, Christian Orthodox, and like, now, you know, life has this this meaning and purpose uh, and fullness, whereas before it it was empty in a way. So, is that that helpful? Yeah, that's super helpful. John? Yeah, I've, I've been reading a lot of church fathers for the past couple of years. And the point that you were making about trying to set aside this sort of juridical punishment sort of thing, and actually what Father Evan was saying today, mm-hmm. it's more healing. Mm-hmm. Um, so the idea that, all right, you're the thief on the cross, and you're like, okay, I get it, everything at this point in time, please remember me, be merciful, healing to me. Okay, so he gets in. Um, it's not that once you're there with the saints, it's like, okay, this is, 
This is it. This is the goal. Because a lot of the church fathers, interestingly, they talk about once you are among the saints, some saints are further along, some are like, well, you got in the door, thank goodness. But it's almost like you enter into a kind of spiritual graduate school. And there are a couple of fathers who talk about, uh, well, your guardian angel is going to be with you, and your guardian angel is now going to be assisting you as you continue to learn and continue to progress. So you're just stepping into a new level of existence, but it's not like, this is it. You, here's the whole prize. Here's the check. You did it. You're just walking into the very beginning of something. Saints are a little further along. So when they cross that threshold or when they step through that veil from this life into the life that the sun provides for us, they're like way up here, whereas those who have the last moment, I'm sorry, please forgive me, have mercy on me. Yeah, they got in, but there's much more to do. It's not like it's all the sort of finished thing once you step mm -hmm. in. And remember, what does St. Paul say? St. Paul says, I am the greatest of sinners. So, you know, if, we, if you want to speak it about in terms of progression, as you get closer to the light, you see more of the stain and the darkness in you. So, you know, I, I think the idea of progression can be helpful, but also, you know, it's, there's, there's no ladder, right? I mean, there's a ladder of divine ascent, but it's not, it's, it's not like I'm on the 15th run, where are you? Um, but there, there, there's no, you know, I'm here and then I'm moving to the next step and the next step and the next step. You can go from step one to step 30 in a day. And that's very clear. It's very clear in the church that you can do that. Um, and, you know, I, I said this, I think, in the first class as well, that uh, it's, it's really a beautiful thing. Because like the, like the superstars, right, who are the athletes, none of us here are going to be athletes. You have to work your entire life if you want to, you know, be a professional athlete. But you can become a saint in a day. You really can. You can become a saint in a day. And that's open and available to all of us. And um, so that, that's, I, I think that's really important for us to realize that all of this is possible. And when you read these stories, again, that's, that's what can be sometimes distracting about the more miraculous type stories. And they're like, well, I'm never going to do that. Well, maybe not. But can you, can you be a, make a concerted effort to stop judging? That's something you can definitely work on. Right? And by the grace of God, these things are available to us. And we really can participate in the divine life this way. Um, and I think, you know, marriage is a great way that, that we, can, we can work on those things. <laughs> right? Um, okay, so anyway, I, I, I want to just pop up again, you know, uh, in the church, how, how we have some, uh, you know, married saints that are highlighted. Of course, the most popular ones, honestly, are probably Old Testament saints, right? And I went back and I pulled out the, the marriage ceremony, and I read through the marriage ceremony and the prayers. And as we bless a couple in the marriage ceremony, we say, bless them as you blessed Abraham and Isaac, or sorry, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca. Joseph and Asenath, Moses and Zipporah, Joachim and Anna, Zacharias and Elizabeth. So we really highlight all these, especially Old Testament saints, and you know, pull them up as examples. All of them had children. All of them you know, raised up holy children. So this is holy work uh, to participate in. And as we move in and transition, let's say, into the New Testament... One of the first married saints that are, that are mentioned are in, the new, in, in Acts. Anybody know the two saints in Acts that are mentioned? Who? Oh, no. Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Perfect. So Priscilla and Aquila are uh, two saints that went around with St. Paul. And they're mentioned in Acts in um, two or three locations. And they were uh, from the region of Corinth. Because they're also measured in the letter to uh, the Corinthians. And, uh, oh, and also Romans and Timothy. So they, they're quite prevalent in the New Testament. 
And they actually had a role of, of teaching and going around with St. Paul. And uh, they, they taught Apollos, who was also in Corinth. So they were very well known. And um, there's some great lines that speaks about them. Uh, here's one I printed out here. Ah, great Pris- in Romans, great Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks. So, you know, they, they were in this role where they were intimately, you know, connected with St. Paul. They were going around and traveling with them. Somehow they saved, they saved by their own, uh, at their own risk, the life of St. Paul. So uh, um, just highlighting those at the beginning. I, I haven't, I don't recall a full, uh, let's say, uh, hagiographic tale on them, but they, they are mentioned quite extensively in, in uh, the New Testament, certainly more than any, any other, like, you know, secondary character, almost. Yeah? Um, the first, the word hagiographic. Yeah, yeah. A... Uh, hagiography, just a, a story written about a saint. Oh. So, it's from the Greek, of course. <laughs> Agios is holy, holy one, saint, and then graphos, to write about. Yeah. So there's, we don't, beyond scripture, we don't actually know much about Priscilla and Paul. I, I don't recall. There could be. There's not a lot of uh, uh, hagiographic tales from the first century, especially the early on ones. Uh, I, I was going to pick another story that we were going to read on that was called uh, this, the, um, uh, it could, could just be called Paul and Thecla. Thecla is also mentioned quite a bit, and there's a whole story written about Paul and Thecla, Thecla traveling around with Paul. Um, that's, you know, an extra biblical tale. Um, but as if you remember this from two weeks ago, Thecla has been rejected by the Catholic Church. So she's not even a saint in the Catholic Church um, because there's not enough historical information to verify her identity or her role. Um, but... Anyway, yeah. If you're interested in an extra biblical story of Aquila and Priscilla, Paul the Apostle of Christ came out in 2018. Kind of a chosen type thing. Uh-huh. Uh, with uh, Jim Caviezel as Luke. Oh. And who visits Paul in prison and visits Aquila and Priscilla doing their work for the persecuted church. Oh. So it, he probably found it somewhere. Paul the Apostle of Christ. Oh, that's neat. Very nice. Thank you. Um, okay, so any other, before we get into the lives of Peter's and, Peter and Favronia? Yeah? Uh, Peter was married? Peter was married to Favronia. No. Oh, no, the father of Jesus, before. the apostle. He was married. Oh, yes, he was married. That's why you know he was a saint, right? Because he lived with his mother-in-law? <laughs> right? It's kind of... Do we know anything about his wife? Um, not that I recall, any. not that I recall, no, uh-uh, but, yeah, that's kind of a good joke about that. He was long-suffering. He was, yeah, right, that's right. Okay, so, uh, this story is a, a, of uh, Peter and Favronia. Um, first, we'll just start off with historical things, and then we'll get into the text itself. Uh, they, they were late 12th century, early 13th century. They both died in 1228. As you read, they died on the same day. It wound up actually being Pascha that they died on, the day that they died on. That wasn't in the story, um, but that's in a separate story. Uh, I was talking to Shmasiana before, and she said there's so many different stories of the lives of Peter and Favronia. This is one of them. Okay, so this isn't the sole story that involves them. Um, but, but one of the other stories that I had read mentioned that they both died on Pascha. Uh, the story itself was written in the 16th century by a, let's say, um, an educated monk. He worked in, at one point in his life, he worked in what wound up becoming like, I don't want to say a saint story factory, but he worked with a bishop, and the bishop said, I want you to collect all of these oral uh, and written stories, and essentially combine them into a, um, you know, a book, make a book of all the lives of the saints. And so we had several people that were working together to create all the lives of the saints and, and combine them into one book. 
So uh, the author, Ermolaus Erasmus, in 1560, uh, collected this story. There was apparently an earlier version that preceded him. His version just became the most famous in, in Russia. And uh, it's, again, one of many, many stories that he had, re- uh, had written and collected, mostly from oral tradition. What we're going to find is most of these lives of the saints were just part of the oral tradition of uh, countries. Most people weren't learned enough to read. And so these, these stories were just passed on from generation to generation. So if we just look at the timeline here, you know, we're looking at 300 years after the passing of the saints before the story was really established and written down for the first time. And as I said, the the other stories that we've read, the ones that we're going to read, have a much different character from this one, right? This one is extraordinary in a lot of ways. Um, It has this fairy tale uh, feeling to it. And uh, some, some notes about it that I picked up on one, a lot of stories that, we, that you read oftentimes elevate the aristocracy or royalty, whereas this story kind of does the opposite, right? It more elevates the role of the peasantry above the aristocracy, okay? Everybody's going to uh, Fevronia for her advice, for her wisdom, and for her healing, and they wind up kind of, you know, pushing against her, but then she wins out in the end, Right? So it, it, it celebrates this peasantry over the aristocracy. And then in a lot of ways, it concentrates on some everyday aspects of life as well. Okay? And, uh, you know, their, the, their interaction with the other aristocracy, them being at dinner together. And uh, so some, some small aspects of everyday life as well. Where, while there's also the extraordinary aspects um, of the story too. Um, so, again, with uh, Peter and Favronia, they were in the 12th to 13th century. He was the Prince of Murom, which is about 200 miles east of Moscow. And uh, they, they have a historical reference as well. So there is you know, documentation that shows that they were a real married couple. And they had three children. And as I said already, they, they died on Easter Sunday. I actually, I want to pass off and ask Shamasiaina because... You've been to see them, is that right? And so I thought maybe you'd like to share a little bit about that. I don't know what you want me to say. Well, you've been there, and you have an icon from them too, right? I was on a trip to St. Seraphim and Kitara, and it was an unplanned trip, as the previous one was an unplanned trip. And uh, we were on a bus trip that left in the middle of the night. It was a long way, but we... We went down and coming back from um, Duivo, they just pulled into some place. We didn't know where we were. Everyone was speaking Russian. Of course, I don't speak any Russian. And they were, we went into this church and there was these two caskets. And um, we were, my English friend with me, we're saying, what do you think's happening here? I don't know, we don't know. <laughs> Everyone was buying this icon. And so this icon was on their, on their, Tombs, you can venerate it if you choose. Anyway, um, she was a beekeeper, and they were, and I'm thinking, okay, how is this tied in? But she, she was working with things that were sharp and stinging, but she, they made sweetness, and so that came out in the story. And um, anyway, they, um, when they came to, don't you pass it around? <laughs> They, um, the people put them in these caskets after they died, and they came in in the morning, and neither one of them were in the caskets, and they were in the ground in Moran. And uh, but now apparently they're not. That is southeast of uh, Moscow, uh, probably more than two hours. Oh, as I, I said two hundred miles. I don't. I'm not well, sure. Well, it was. We were on this bus when we went to Dvivo about twelve hours, and uh, we got on it at night, and then went through the night, and then coming back, we were probably halfway back or something. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know mm-hmm. whether they were going some strange way. I, mean, I don't know. Well, we were on a bus for 12, or car for 12 hours in Africa, and we didn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> was I? <laughs> yes. I was with you, in Kenya. I? <laughs> okay. Well, Ouch. apparently they're buried now northeast of Moscow, and they uh, unearthed them from... Oh, they've moved them. And 
I can't remember, St. Elizabeth's, I think, up there. Mm. But anyway, um, they, they came out and we were at this tomb, and apparently they were in the tomb, of the, and they wanted to be together, everyone kept saying. So I thought, okay, may it be blessed. So anyway, we, we took this icon around, and then everybody, they were doing whatever they do with them, and it was all good. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an unplanned stop, and it's only taken a while for us to collect the... <laughs> The stories and, and the names apparently of them are varied. I mean, some say that they were not Peter and Fabroni until they were uh, Chris, not Chris, until they were. Yeah, the it, from what I read, it, the names are switched. Like they were originally Prince David and yes. uh, uh, Ephrosinia. Yes, yes. And so the names somehow switched. I don't know how that. Well, so I kept reading over and over the same. Too, and, yeah. and uh, whether they were given those names, but then others were calling him Prince Peter, and some said Prince David. So mm -hmm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. who knows? Yeah, I don't speak Russian, as yeah. I said. So. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. there you go. There we go. Thank you. Um, wait, so you know, you wind up going to Russia or Greece or a lot of these old countries, and you find that the saints are everywhere, and there's such a local following. Mm -hmm. You know, for for um, these saints, uh, Andrea was just telling me a story about her sister being in uh, Dechini in Serbia, and which is a very very famous monastery there, and how she you know had this opportunity to see the relics of Saint Stephen, Saint Stephen of Serbia, um, who was you know one of the founders of Orthodoxy in Serbia, and um, so in these countries, you know. The Orthodox faith is, is very much alive and part of the culture um, and inculcated really into the fabric of everything in the culture, um, which is what I always find you know, interesting when, when, these, when these people come to uh, the United States. That, and This is why I try to not give too much grief to Greeks who want to still be Greek at their parish, because being Orthodox and being Greek is the same thing. In Greece. In Greece. But when they come here, they, they take that notion with them. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody here would think that being American meant being Orthodox. Mm -hmm. May it be so. Yeah. But, you know, these old countries, you were Greek, you were Orthodox. If you were Orthodox, you were Greek. If you went to Serbia, if you were Serbian, you were Orthodox. If you were Orthodox, you were Serbian. So there, there's this... There's this you know, interweaving between culture and, um, you know, being Orthodox that we just so unfamiliar with here. Um, but it's a really beautiful thing and it, it, it surrounds and is everything, it, it, it's everything, you know, in their lives just points to that. Imagine going to the restaurant and being like, oh, sorry, it's Wednesday. We only have fasting food today. And you're like, oh, well, I knew that, of course. Um, so, you know, everything, everything is really focused and points to that in these countries. So it's really, it's beautiful to experience things like this. And I, I would wish that everyone would get to have that kind of experience of visiting these, these countries and, and seeing, uh, seeing how people live that out. Well, but, apparently I was gone for the last month and I was with a bishop at one point and he wanted to know if we had read in the, um, the New York Times that the fastest growing, um, Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty amazing. There was a thing in the Wall Street Journal about a month ago on that too. Yeah, yeah, so yeah I saw that too. Um, okay, so uh, the story itself now, I've been dancing around. Um, again, we said fairy tale, just a, a brief overview, right? We have, we have this kind of interesting interaction with uh, this demon that's, or a serpent, right? A demon that's appearing in the... Uh, home of Prince Paul and is like tricking his wife into believing that it's Prince Paul, right? So we have this kind of interesting little story that almost seems like this complete aside from the rest of the story. Um, and again, I'm not a good literary an analyst here, so I'm not going to try to, you know, figure out what's going on or why they're doing it. Um, but, you know, from this interaction, we wind up uh, having this little prophecy that comes out that, that, well, first of all, the, Paul's wife uses the ego of the demon in order to trick the demon into saying how the demon will be destroyed, which I think is great. It's basically like flatter the demon, 
and then ask the demon how you're going to be killed, right? Because she says, you certainly know everything. This is the wife talking to the demon. And so you must certainly know what kind of death you are destined. So she uses ego in order to you know, ultimately destroy the demon. And so he gives this prophecy of his own death that Peter will kill me by Agric's sword. And you're like, what is going on here? I used to, I, I, when I first read the story, I was like, is this the lives of saints that we're reading here? It seems kind of a little bit, um, again, fairy tale or something that's just part of a movie or something. Sorry? Rumpelstiltskin, right. Yeah, again, like this fairy tale. And, you know, they wind up realizing that Peter is Paul's brother. And then Peter randomly is walking and he comes across this, what, stable hand or youth. And the youth says, I know what Agric's sword is. It's in the altar of the church. So there's, an, there's, a, there's a sword that's behind the brick, bricks in the altar of the church. So all of this is, again, very extraordinary tale. And I'm sure we could go through here, and, and I wish that, that um, I had some, some great analysis that, you know, the sword represents this, and it's in the church, and... And does the demon really represent the fact that his wife was actually an adulteress and trying to get out? I don't know any of that. Um, I, wish I, I wish I had some good analysis there because I think it would be really fun to, to kind of tease out some more. But I'm not going to make any of it up also. We could because it would be kind of fun, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Justin? Before you get to Peter, I thought it was very interesting that Paul did not punish necessarily his wife. He, he actually recognized the demon and sought to help her out, not put her away or right. punish her or whatever. That, that kind of, to me, set the tone yeah. for the rest of the story. That Paul, he wasn't looking to hurt his wife. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So there, there's a, you know, a good little prelude to the rest of the story in terms of marriage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we continue on and, and, you know, in the story now, this is, this is for me when I was reading it, when I read it uh, uh, again yesterday, um, I thought there was going to be this whole trickery thing that happened that I was going through, right? So Peter goes and sees Paul in the room with Paul's wife and he's like, oh, there's Paul. And then he goes out and then the servant says, no, Paul's actually in the other room. So he goes into the other room, and Paul, and then the Paul in the other room is like, oh no, that must be the demon. And you know what my first thought was? That's the demon uh-huh. yeah. tricking Peter into killing his actual brother, Paul. I thought that's what was going to happen. Like, I was like, ooh, this is going to be a good movie twist plot, <laughs> and that's what's going to happen. But, uh, of course, it didn't. It actually was the demon in the other room. He goes in, he slays the demon. And which is a serpent, so a clear, you know, indication of evil. And the blood goes spraying everywhere. And where it lands on Peter, he gets these sores. And I, I read in a couple other stories that these were uh, a leprosy. Now, this is kind of interesting, too. Old Testament, you think of leprosy and automatically what comes to mind? The biblical stories, of course. But what, what, what would somebody have said about somebody who had leprosy in the Old Testament? Unclean. Unclean. So this is where my mind started playing with this idea of, like, is there some kind of sin that's being involved here? Like, he has this uncleanness, and then he has to be cleansed of this uncleanness. I don't know. That's just where my mind was going a little bit, uh, thinking about that. Um, And then, of course, from there, we have um, uh, Prince Peter now has this leprosy and going to, to be healed from it. And, you know, scours the... Uh, scours the countryside and unwittingly a soldier comes across this maiden in the village and you know essentially says you know we're looking for this person to to heal peter and there's this odd dialogue again that we encounter of all of these wise statements and these these sayings that she says to this young soldier and it seems like really almost unnecessary in the story but its purpose is to do what? Sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I'm just going to throw questions out there. Show her wisdom. Yeah, show her wisdom, right? That she this, isn't this just is a, a simple, simple maiden. Girl. This is not a simple peasant girl. So she's very wise, 
And, um, you know, they're, they're looking for a wise person to, to, to heal Peter. And so this, this servant, through these, you know, few little statements, has, has found the ability to, or found someone who can heal Peter. And, uh, again, I don't want to belabor and go through, you know, sentence by sentence, but she winds up giving a cure to the soldier who then winds up healing Peter. And her request for payment is? Marriage. Marriage. And Peter initially doesn't want to get married. Why? She's a commoner. Yeah, she's a commoner. So Peter doesn't want to get married to this commoner. And so after taking this cure and agreeing to the cure, uh, says, no, I'm not going to actually do that after all. So he reneges, and she's persistent, I guess. She really wants to marry this prince, even though it kind of seems like, you know, I don't know, he doesn't seem like that great of a guy on the, on the front side of things. And uh, he, you know, he falls, he falls uh, ill again, and she resends the cure, basically with like, well, you got to marry me. And he decides, uh, really good decision to, to marry her. So that, that kind of, you know, takes us to uh, the end of this introduction sec- section of, you know, how, how Peter and Fevronia get married. And then from there, it's really more about their, their life as a married couple. And, you know, I, I, I thought about this in, in terms of two aspects. One, the, the, the first half of it, it's only a few pages, but deals with the assaults of the world on their marriage. Okay? So all of the things in the world that are, are trying to stop them from being married. And it's very easy to recognize what these assaults are, right? We have a royalty married to a commoner. So, you know, there's a clear way to separate them there, okay? And then we also have the part that she was wise, right? So a wise woman who was, you know, in this position, let's say, over the other women, in some ways, you know, the other aristocracy, and and these people who weren't, you know, very wise had took issue with that. So there is a desire for separation because of that. And again, I don't want to go through the details. You all read it. But what I would highlight from this is that through these struggles with the world, the couple are united in their desire to be servants to each other. Right? And really, in this, in this whole story, there's, there's very little that's mentioned on the, you know, on the church side of things. The only real line that we have that points to you know, their faith in Christ in this section is when they reference the Gospel of Matthew. Right? But I say unto you that whosoever puts away his wife, saving for the cause of unchastity, makes her an adulteress. So they try to get rid of Fevronia. And Peter says, I can't get rid of her, so if you want to get rid of her, I'm going to. So essentially he abdicates, right? So he gives everything up in, in order to stay married to his wife. And she leaves it up to him in the first place. She doesn't say, you know, I will go or I won't go. I'll leave it up to him. And, you know, from there they leave. And they have, of course, these, these little interactions when they're at the, on the boat. There's a man that is lusting over Fevronia, and she calls him out on it. Yes. Right? Get him. Mm-hmm. Said get him. Get him. <laughs> and she does so in a really great way. Uh, you know, really in a, in a correcting way, but not necessarily in an embarrassing way, I think. You know, th- this happens quite often where... Um, somebody is called out for their sin without being directly called out for their sin, right? So she does what I would call in a very loving way. You know, oh, drink the water, drink the water here, drink the water there. Is it any different? You should probably just stick with the water that you've got. So, um, you know, so I think there's, you know, there's a, there's a good lesson there as well that we're not meant to just openly rebuke and embarrass people, but, but, uh, but hopefully lovingly correct and so, obviously, we hear in the story that the people of the court wind up fighting each other. They wind up uh, not being able to self-govern. And then they call back Peter and they say, actually, we need you to be uh, the ruler. And so he returns and, and they both take on their, their former positions uh, in the court. And then, you know, the end of the story um, 
uh, comes with the, the falling asleep of the couple. We see that they were united in life just as they were united in death. They both went to separate monasteries and they write to each other, you know, over the, the, the course of, of their lives, the end of their lives after they've had children. And they, they ask each other, you know, when you die, I want to die on the same day. And so they exchange these letters towards the end of their life. And I love it. Fevronia says, no, 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 not yet. I have to fi- 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 finish this garment that's going to be put over the chalice in the church. So don't die yet until I finish it. And then as soon as she finishes it, they bind- both wind up, you know, passing away on the same day. And then their last wish is that they, they're, they're monastics at this point. So monastics, you know, would not be buried with each other, uh, but they desire to be buried in the same tomb. People are a little bit scandalized by this, so they bury them in separate caskets in different monasteries, or they put them in the church in uh, two different churches. And as happens many, many times, I'll tell another story, many, many times um, they're in two separate places, and the next day they appear together. And then they move them back, and then they appear together, move them back, appear together, and they're like, Okay, I guess we'll just leave them alone. Um, this happens a lot. These kinds of things happen a lot. In, in uh, this monastery that I stayed, stayed at in Mount Athos, they, had a, they have a famous wonder-working icon there. And this wonder-working icon is actually from another monastery that's several miles away. And one day in the morning... Bring a picture of that one. Bring an icon I do have a picture of it, yeah. Yeah. Mine's in my office if you want to show it. Oh, you want to grab, go grab it? Uh, so this icon uh, used to be at this other monastery, and then the next morning it appeared in this one that I was staying at. Not when I was there. This was hundreds of years ago. And they're like, what did this, what's this icon doing here? It should, you know, how did it get here? And they're like, I don't know how it got here. And so they took it back to the other monastery. And it, it, it wasn't like super close, right? It takes a long time to get there. And so they took it back. And then before those brothers had even returned, the next morning, it was back in that monastery. And they're like, huh, this is really weird. Well, let's take it back. So they took the, they took the icon back to the other monastery. And uh, here it is. Uh, this is called Odiithria. This It's this icon right here, not the whole thing. Um, and this happened two or three times. And then by the third time, you're like, mm, I guess it's supposed to be here. Um, so this is a... It's, Again, this, this one that's depicted here. So uh, this, this moving of icons, of relics, of, of, of items happens quite a lot. You read these stories all the time, um, and I love them. They're so, they're so great. It's just like, well, okay, this is where it's supposed to be. We're going to pass it around. If you, want to, uh, if you want to be there, we're going to leave you there. Uh, so this is exactly the case that happened with uh, Peter and Favronia after they passed away. Uh, they put them in the same casket eventually, uh, separated by a small little barrier, and uh, then they were, they were buried that way, and then apparently moved later in life. Hundreds of years. I think Hundreds later, of years later. They hauled them a long, long, long way away. They should have done that. I'm not in charge. So. No, I, 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 <laughs> my first reaction is they should have honored their wishes. I don't know. I don't know, actually. Well, if they... I read the red trying to figure out why they were moved, but I have no a lot. I, I actually want to say that they might have been moved by the Soviets. Oh yes, it might have been. Oh. I think they were moved by the Soviets. Why on earth would the Soviets have moved them? Oh, they they got rid of relics everywhere. I I think they put them into storage. They put them in storage. Except for Lenin. Yeah, except for Lenin. He's your socialist relic for a while. Yeah, no, I think they they took a lot of relics and things like that, and they they I heard there's an office. It was called the office of. Formerly religious things, so, or no, to hide away from the people. But you know, why not just destroy them? They did a lot. They okay. did a lot of them, but you know, there are also you know in the KGB and in the Soviets, there were there were holy people that were still there, and so I don't. This is this is just me talking. But, you know, it's possible that someone was like, oh, let's destroy it. And somebody who was really, you know, legit was like, no, we should keep them for this reason, whatever. Well, and so they weren't destroyed. They did the same thing with Lenin. And he, you know, when he died, there was enough Orthodox people there that they said he wouldn't deteriorate. And so they went to some trouble to keep him from deteriorating. 
when the Soviets fell, they stopped doing it. He went away. <laughs> So I thought how interesting that they tried to they tried to follow the orthodox they tried to mimic idea. They I mean, tried to show that he was holy, that he was oh something that well, you should follow. You, you see this stuff in World War II as well, right? With with the holy mountain, right? Like uh, Hitler's fascination with certain holy things, and icons uh -huh. of the holy mountain. Like, why would he be interested in that? He in many ways, they were trying to eradicate or uh, copy Christianity and create a, a kind of Reich Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's this kind of, what would you call it, like a, a, a poverty of spirit that has a fascination with these things and yep. encounters them enough to know that they're worthy of respect, but doesn't... We've all seen them. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um... <laughs> But yeah, so uh, it's very possible that it happened in that time. That the, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I read that their relics were taken by the Soviets, and possibly the church was destroyed explains, where they were. That explains the dishonor. Then. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's very likely that the church was destroyed where they originally were, oh. and so because the Soviets destroyed tens of thousands of churches. Yeah. So I want to tell a quick story about how did you pronounce it? Decheny. Oh, Decheny. Decheny. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Holy Martyr Stephen was king who established Orthodoxy in Serbia, um, and it's the only monastery in that area that's never actually been burned down or sacked or destroyed at all, so it's intact from the 13th century, yeah. something like that. And so, there were times when various political factions have tried to remove his relics from the monastery, and they couldn't. Yeah. Like, they would put it on a wagon, and the wagon would move, and all sorts of stories about that. And he's still there, incorrupt, and that was what the abbot opened the sarcophagus mm -hmm. and allowed his sister to venerate him. But, so, sometimes, you know, you wonder if the Soviets, like, tried and sometimes weren't successful, and who knows? Mm -hmm. But I know that that happened there, according to the tradition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's great. I love these stories. Yeah. You can just like share these stories all day long. Mm -hmm. and, it, and again, the purpose isn't just like Sherry's, a story sharing, but to realize God is wondrous in his saints. Mm -hmm. And the saints are present and you know, God is manifest in our lives. That's mm -hmm. what the purpose of all of this is about. Mm -hmm. uh, and reading all of the lives of the saints is about. And, and as with this story, like again, it, it's, it's this fairy tale aspect to it. And this is one, this, this is probably the, they're the most famous married couple in, in Russia, without a doubt. And they're very, very well known, very revered uh, in Russia. And, um, and you know, everybody know, knows their story. And so this is, again, the backbone very much of the culture. And, and it's, a, it's good for us to also, you know, bring this into our own culture and, and become familiar with the saints not as just something exterior, something in regional, but something that's, that's intimate and something that's you know, ever-present amongst us and that we can participate in these lives in a very real way um, and you know, consider in a way that the saints are our friends, right? People that, that, that are beloved by God and that pray for us continually and that we... We are of one body, even though they lived 800 years ago in a you know, country across the world, that we're all part of the same body of Christ. So that's what's really, really important to realize when we re read these lives. So. And I think it's important, probably not to overthink these things, mm -hmm. because um, trying to figure it out, <laughs> trying to figure out why, this, why did that cobbler, why was he more holy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, just figure this out. I mean, figure this out. We just have to, we have to sit there. Because there could be another cobbler that is over there who's been a nice guy, but wait in the store. So mm -hmm. kind of figure it out with our brain. Mm -hmm. It probably needs to go to your soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My sister also said that when they opened the sarcophagus, there was this wonderful fragrance. Yeah. And that she had smelled it before on another working icon elsewhere. The same Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have some myrrh from St. Demetrius in Thessaloniki. Also, I'll try to remember to bring it next week since we're I talking have, about the I martyrs. Have these little crosses that I wear, and they are, they have, mm -hmm. and you open them, and they're, um, I put, stuck it up from various trees. Yeah. And they're very sweet smelling. 
Yeah, Saint Demetrius, his, his, his title is Saint Demetrius the Myrrh Gusher. <laughs> and the tomb that he was built in, they actually had to build channels because the myrrh would flow out like a river from him. And they built these, if you go to the church, there are still these big pools that you can see. Because the myrrh would literally gush out of his tomb and fill these pools. And every year on his feast day, he still exudes myrrh. And they go and they take a whole bunch of cotton balls and like just put it on his relics and collect all of the myrrh from the relics. And then they hand those out to, to people on the feast day. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's really beautiful. But, so that sweet smelling myrrh comes from <clears throat> many different things. Even yes. Paper icons. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. It wouldn't disintegrate. <laughs> mm-hmm. Got, uh, scented myrrh. And none of them that I have, I mean, I have a little cupboard full of all these, these, um, oils that were myrrhs. And they all smell different. Yeah. So it's sweet, but not the same. Mm-hmm. It's an oil that comes from, what is it? You can buy myrrh. It's a, I don't know, it's an anointing oil. It comes from a plant, I would say, probably. I don't know if it comes from a sap or like, like essential a, oil. But yeah, it comes, I mean, it's all, it, a, a lot of those older, uh, you know, like frankincense is a sap. You ever hear frankincense? That's a sap from a tree. Um, myrrh, I would think, is some kind of, is an extract from a tree. A tree or bush. I'm not, it, it I'm not sure. Like a resin. Myrrh does? It, it can't do that. That's okay. I don't doubt it. that it comes, it's like a sap from a tree. A lot of those scented, scented oils used for anointing came from, came from trees or bushes. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is a super cool idea that we like that a snake would be like a tree exuding mm. sap. Oh, yeah. The same would be living and growing like yeah. a tree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, anything else? I'd love to know what John and Jesuits make of this story. Because he's good at taking fairy stories. He is, yeah. The Christian underpinning. Snow White, you know, the apple dies, Prince brings her back to life with a kiss. You can see the Christian parallel. Right. This is the saint's life. The Sabbath fairy tale. Right. I, I would, you would have something to say about that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, great. All right, well, thank you.